ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'd like to introduce Scott Carnegie. He's a friend of mine. We've uh, actually joined together in some uh, endeavors in Winnipeg and from time to time, one with the Unison Festival. Uh, he was the fellow who vi videotaped, or the videographer who put together uh, the the non-believers' non beliefs, a video that PZ Myers is in, and myself, and, and Jim Newman, and some other people who are in the room here tonight. And uh, he's going to talk about his uh, journey into and out of Mormonism, and finally it, how he landed on his feet as a well-rounded atheist, and I think a humanist as well. Uh, please welcome Scott Carnegie. <laughs> Thank you for inviting me here. Uh, Jeff, this is my first time at a meeting of the Humanist Association, or the new name. Um, <laughs> though I have kind of been involved in, in, with, in a few years, I'm very involved with the Winnipeg Skeptics, um, and there's a lot of crossover between us and them, so uh, I'm glad I could be here to tell you a little bit about my story, which I call do Doctrine In, Doctrine Out. You might have heard the term before, garbage in, garbage out. If you get garbage in, you get garbage out. Well, that's where this kind of came from, uh, why I joined and then left the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, aka Mormons. I'm going to say Mormons because that's just way easier to say, um, but the actual name of the church is the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. What I, I'm going to talk fast, so I'll try not to go too much. I'm a fast talker. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today is a little bit about my background, the circumstances that led me into the church, the doctrines that appealed to me, uh, some of the, exper the spiritual experiences that I had, and then why I left. That's kind of the whole package of the story. What I'm not going to talk about, I'm not going to talk about doctrines that aren't applicable to my story, because there's, all, I mean, there's tons of different things in the Mormon church. You'll go on Wikipedia and you'll learn all about them. Go on YouTube and you can find out all the quirky doctrines. Or you can talk to me later about it if you want, but I'm not going to go over that kind of stuff because it's not really relevant to my story. And I'm not going to be bashing the church or religion in general. Uh, I'm going to criticize certain things that were, like I said, applicable to my story, but in general I'm not going to be bashing. Oh, okay. In brief, <clears throat> I grew up in the Catholic uh, faith. Um, my mom and her side of the family were Catholic. I went to church now and then. I uh, wasn't hardcore or anything like that, but I was interested in religion uh, as a teenager as well. Even though I stopped going to Catholic church when I was about 12, 13, at one point I was interested in becoming a Catholic priest, and I had talked to the priest in our local congregation about, about that. Uh, but, but it waned over time, but I was always interested in religion as far as where they come from, what they believe, and why they believe it. Those were sort of the three questions that were important to me at the time. Uh, I converted to Mormonism when I was 21, and I'll get into the story of how that happened. Uh, I stopped attending when I was 32, so I was uh, fully active for 11 years, and this was seven years ago now, and I officially resigned just a few months ago. Uh, so I was still a member on paper for about seven years, so I wasn't active, and finally I just said, well, they made it really easy. They had an email. I didn't have to like, write this big letter. I just sent an email with my details, and that kind of got it going. So making it easy uh, helped me out a lot to, to get it going. So when I was a Mormon, I was fully active and faithful, meaning I really did believe it. I wasn't just a guy that went because of social pressures or, or anything like that. I went because <coughs> I believed it. I was templing down which means I went through the temple. If you've heard of a Mormon temple, you go through, and there's sort of a special ceremony uh, you go through, and that's for Mormons that uh, you have to be interviewed by like the state president, which is like way up here, and, and make sure you're worthy and all that kind of stuff. Uh, I was sealed to my spouse in the temple. Again, this is sort of um, uh, something for Mormons to achieve is to be sealed in the temple. That means you're doing well. That means you're on the right path to God. The reason why I bring this up is just to show that I was an actual faithful Mormon. I wasn't just... Like I said, a guy there for kicks. Uh, I had held various positions in the church. I was a teacher in Sunday school and in priesthood courses. I was a ward clerk. I did a lot of missionary work. I was never, uh, I never went knocking on doors uh, for two years uh, because I converted usually after uh, men are on their mission. Uh, but by the time, sorry, they usually go under 19 to 21 years old. I joined as almost 22, so I never really went on a mission. But I did a lot of missionary work. With the missionaries, they would I go. They take me with them to meet new people, and I talk to them. And because I was a young single man, so I think they liked taking me to show, hey, even this young single guy can join the church. And I, I think that's why, anyways. And I held the Melchizedek priesthood, and which is just there's different kinds of priesthoods in in the church, and I held the Melchizedek priesthood. So the circumstances leading to me joining the church, I have an auntie and uncle who are members of the church. Uh, they converted a long time ago, like in the 70s, 
and all of their children are members, and they're, I have some, some of the kids are about my age, and I've been friends with them for a long time. And um, I moved to Brandon. I, I grew up in the pod, I moved to Brandon, and that's where they live. So I got to be chums with my cousins. A woman broke my heart, and I just felt so bad. I said, I called my cousin, I said, cousin, take me to church with you. I'm, I need some spiritual enlightenment. I need to feel better. And that's what happened. So when I went to their church, I went to for a few weeks, and I found their teachings were appealing. I'll talk a little bit more about which ones I found appealing. But I liked it there. It wasn't uh, the old boring Catholic church that I went to. Um, it was kind of interesting. It was engaging. I met with the missionaries. So the missionaries are there at the church, uh, and they scout people out. Oh, he's new. We're going to go talk to him. And said, would you like to take the lessons, there's like, there, at the time, it's changed a little bit now, but at the time there were formal talks that were given, or lessons that were given, to people that wanted to investigate the church. And so I did, I said, sure, come on in. So you've seen these guys, they're missionaries, right? These aren't my actual missionaries, it's just some soft little, but you know, it's the white shirt, it's the main tag, riding the bikes, you know, knocking on the doors. These are Mormon missionaries, like I said, they're like usually 19 to, 19 to 21 years old. And they go, and they go for two years. I was lucky though, because I had sister missionaries. Uh, that's me with the sister missionaries, Sister Jennings and Sister DeForest. And um, so they're the ones that taught me the, the lessons. And so here's some of the teachings that I found appealing as I was being taught um, the doctrines and as I was going to church. So this is both from actually attending the church and also from these lessons that the missionaries were giving me. Baptism was at eight, year, eight years old. They didn't baptize babies. I felt that appealing because that was a doctrine that bothered me when I was a Catholic, the baptizing babies thing. So they couldn't choose to be baptized, so I thought, okay, sure, that makes sense. Uh, there's no hell in Mormonism, and there are three heavens, so you have like three chances to make it. <laughs> um, and it's, you know, it's like if you're really good, you're up here. If you're, you're pretty good, you're here, and you're, you know, you're like, you know, you're not very good, you're here, but it's still heaven. So there is something called outer darkness in Mormon uh, doctrine. That's like for demons, like really, like sons of perdition, like denying the Holy Ghost once you have an actual knowledge of like Satan, okay? So not really applicable to us humans. So no hell, three heavens. It's all right. Proxy baptism, a.k.a. baptism for the dead. You've probably heard about this um, recently. There's, this comes up in the news once in a while. Just a brief explanation of why I liked it is that question that a lot of people have, like, what about, so the Christian will say, you have to be baptized if you want to go to heaven. Okay, well, what about the people that died without hearing the gospel? Oh, well, they're going to hell or they're going to purgatory, whatever it is. Mormons had an answer for that, which is proxy baptism. So if you had a relative, this is part of why Mormons do a lot of genealogy, is they'll um, say, okay, my, my great, great, great grandpa, he never heard the gospel, and here's his information, have his name, his birthday, birthplace, etc. You take that name, you go to the temple, and someone gets baptized in their place. So, and I did this a few times where you go, you, you stand there, you're going to baptize a person, and there's a little list in front of you, and you read out the names. You know, I baptize you in the name of blah, 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 who is dead, and you dip them. And now that person's been baptized up in, uh, where they're in spiritual prison right now. Once they get baptized on earth, then they can go into spiritual paradise, which is a waiting place for after the final judgment. So... There's, oh, there's a lot of doctrine. Um, but I found that appealing because it answered the, the problem of what about the people that never heard the gospel. And modern day revelation, I really like this, uh, where just like Moses and uh, Abraham and the prophets of the Old Testament and the New Testament, there's a prophet today who received revelation for the entire world direct from God. I was like, wow, that's pretty awesome. If that's true, I thought, if I thought if that's true, that's incredible. I found that very appealing. We don't have to guess anymore. We don't have to, you know, there's so many interpretations of scripture. We don't have to, to guess. We can know for sure from God. That's pretty cool. There's a few teachings I didn't like. Sex out of marriage, that sucks. Um, I was, I'll just say I was 21 uh, when I joined the church. Oh, there we go. No drinking alcohol. Damn. Uh, something called the Word of Wisdom, sort of Mormon health code, not drinking alcohol is part of it. It's also you don't drink coffee or tea. Those weren't a problem for me, but not drinking alcohol ever was a problem for, for a little while. But eventually I was like, okay. And I didn't drink for uh, 11, 11 years. 
White shirts and ties, they all wore white shirts and ties and really bugged me. I don't like white shirts and ties. It felt too business-like to me. Now, that's, that's not a teaching, that's like a cultural thing, but in here you'll see it's a mix of teachings and a mix of culture. That comes up quite a bit in my journey through Mormonism. Uh, but this always annoyed me. Uh, they all dressed up in suits, go to church, like, so, it's so formal, I'm just not a formal kind of person. Um, there was a lot of obedience to the prophet. And I'm sort of an anti-authoritarian, I have been for a long time, so this didn't really always sit well with me, this sort of blind obedience. So when the prophet spoke, the thinking was done, was the attitude some people had, but some people didn't have that attitude, but a lot of them did, uh, and that didn't sit well with me. And until 1978, black people couldn't have the priesthood in the Mormon church, and that bothered me. Um, though later on I could rationalize it once I, I became kind of an apologist, uh, I did a lot of apologetics, so I could explain why they didn't have a priesthood, and it made sense in my head, though it always bothered me in the back of my brain. And if you are not a member of the church, and your kids are going to get married in the temple, you can't go to their wedding. I do not like that. So, what appealed to me about the church? I know I'm just like blazing through this, and there's time for questions at the end, right, Jeff? Okay, good. In case something comes up. Okay, what appealed to me? What appealed to me was the Joseph Smith story. In brief, uh, he's this boy, he's 14 years old, and he's confused about what religion to join. He goes into the woods to pray. He prays, he gets a revelation from God, says, don't join any churches, you're going to start your own. It's going to be my church restored. I thought, that was very appealing to me, because I didn't want to join a church that was just made up by some guy. Or, <laughs> or I, there's this point of doctrine, and this we're going to focus on this, we're going to make our own church and just do this. I know it's ironic because later <laughs> it's a church made up by a guy, right? Uh, <laughs> it is kind of sad in a way, uh, but but I did find that story appealing because that's what I was looking for sort of, for so many years was divinity. Uh, I had a lot of spiritual experiences when I was investigating the church. I'd be reading about uh, doctrine and I'd be getting these uh, you know the butterflies in the chest and just the the wave of of tingly that goes through your body. I was getting that all the time. I'm getting that right now, doing this, this is interesting. Um, now, demons didn't appeal to me, but they're part of the spiritual experience. Uh, around the time I was investigating the church, I was having these things where I would be sleeping and I'd wake up and I'd be paralyzed and I couldn't move. And I felt like demons were trying to enter my body and I was convinced that this was Satan trying to stop me from joining the church. And this happened uh, maybe two or three times within a couple months. So I was pretty convinced that I was doing the right thing because Satan was trying to stop me. And when I talked this experience about, or when I talked about this experience to people I was going to church with, they were like, "Oh yeah, yeah, Satan, he's trying to get you. You better get baptized now before it's too late." <laughs> so, so I did. Um, the church, the members of the church are very friendly and inviting. When you walk in, uh, I felt loved immediately. It was helpful that uh, I did have members of my family uh, in the local ward, or local ward is like a congregation. Um, so I, I knew people, I went there already knowing people, but I did feel very invited, and the people there are very nice, very good people. They really are trying hard to be the best people they can be. And that goes into fellowshipping. Fellowshipping is very good within the Mormon church. If you are struggling, there's immediately, there's people there that will help you. Uh, if you need help moving, it's one phone call and you can have you know 10 people there the next Saturday to help unload your truck. Um, when we had our first child, uh, we didn't have to cook for like three or four days. We had meals constantly just being brought, 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 brought. It was, it was great. So that's very appealing. And again, the modern day revelation really appealed to me, that whole idea of that we can receive revelation from God today for us here today. That would be relevant, not just something that happened 2,000 years ago or, or 4,000 years ago that we would read about, but it's happening now, which made it relevant to me. A couple more things that appealed to me. Uh, the scholarship. There is a great emphasis in the church on the adult members um, continuing their religious education. So it wasn't just, Sunday school wasn't just for kids, it was for everybody. And so I, I like that, I like that intellectual pursuit. Uh, though the scholarship in general is limited to official church sources, uh, but I did like the idea of it. It's a lay ministry, no one on the local level was paid, I thought that made it more honest somehow. And there's a lay Sunday service, which means when you go to the church, there isn't a priest up there that was a prepared sermon that preaches. It's members of the congregation. So the bishop will say, Scott or uh, Jake, Jake, next week you're going to give a 20-minute talk about fasting. 
And then you say, yes, Bishop. Go ahead. Yes, Bishop. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that's how it worked. And I really liked that because it kept it interesting. It kept things moving. And it, it wasn't boring. It got boring like years later after hearing the same message, you know, 20 times. Uh, but I did, like I said, that was appealing to me because it's a lot different than any church service I had been to before. It was an emotionally rich church, like I said, with the spiritual experiences, and they believed, they believed in gifts of the Spirit. And, oh, I hope you're turning down that temperature. Is that what you're doing? Yeah. Oh, thank you. I should be here. And so there's, there's a lot of fostering of the, emotionally, of the emotional experiences. Uh, every month, instead of having uh, Jake come in and speak for a talk, they would just have an like, open mic night. It's called Fast and Testimony Meeting where people would just go up and give their testimony about either God or Christ or anything relevant to them at that time. And that's when I had a lot of those spiritual experiences and a lot of the tinglings and what I thought was the Holy Ghost confirming for me that what this guy was saying is true. Because that, that's something that's preached about in the church is the Holy Ghost will confirm the truthfulness of what someone's testifying to you about. That's how you know if it's true or not. That's evidence. Mormon evidence. Um, oh, the testimony means so I covered that. And even though the word of wisdom was hard to live, I did find it appealing because it set us apart from most of the world. And I like things that would set me apart. I'm just that kind of person. Um, so not drinking made me an anomaly uh, among my friends, and I kind of enjoyed that. It was kind of a little bit of a tension hog sort of thing, I think. Well, you don't drink? Yeah, no, I don't drink. Wow, well, why don't you? You know, and then it, it usually led to a discussion. Well, I don't drink because the prophet said, you know. So, you know? <laughs> What prophet is this? Oh, let me tell you. That means missionary friends. They'll come over your house. Um, <laughs> oh, I was a horrible proselytizer. We'll talk about that later. <laughs> and in case you're not familiar, quick Mormonism 101. This is going to be very brief. Like I said, if you want to know about Mormonism, you can just go and look on Wikipedia, YouTube. There's tons of stuff. Um, but I'll give you sort of things that are important to my story. As founded by Joseph Smith in 1830, like I said, he's the one that prayed and said, which church do I join? Don't join, it. Don't join any of the churches. I, you're going to start your own church. Um, the Golden Plates, you might have heard about the Golden Plates. Joseph Smith was directed by the angel Moroni over to this hill and said, over there, are, dig in the ground, and you're going to find these Golden Plates, and you can translate that into the Book of Mormon. So that's sort of part of the story. Has anyone ever seen the South Park episode on uh, Mormonism? A few people? Yeah, yeah, okay, face in the hat. There you go. Most Mormons don't know that that's how it's translated, so... Anyways, you don't even need the plates, if they existed at all. Okay, so Joseph Smith was the first prophet after the apostasy. So for Mormon doctrine, uh, you had Christ set up his church when he was here, set up his apostles like as a formal church. But after all the prophets and apostles were killed out after a couple hundred years, the priesthood authority was lost, the line was broken, and so Joseph Smith, Joseph Smith restored the priesthood. So it couldn't be a, re a, re a reformation, it had to be a restoration of the priesthood. That's part of the Mormonism doctrine. So it's based upon modern day revelation and authority. If this authority, the authority and revelation are tied together. If you're not getting revelation, then you probably don't have the authority. So that's probably one of the most important doctrines in Mormonism is the modern day revelation. Um, everything's built upon that. And the prophet today is Thomas S. Monson. <laughs> And uh, so some of the document teaching sources that Mormons have uh, is the Book of Mormon, like I said, which is translated from the Golden Plates, the Doctrine and Covenants, which were direct revelations. Everything I'm saying here is like this. I think you get that, right? They're direct revelations <laughs> from God <laughs> to the modern-day prophets, mostly Joseph Smith, and he wrote them down. So he'd be, he'd be like, okay, I'm getting dictation from God. So he, either it was that way, or sometimes he'd be speaking for himself, saying, God says, blah, blah, blah. So that's the Doctrine and Covenants, which for Mormons actually has more bearing upon the church today than Book of Mormon does, because Doctrine and Covenants is like Revelation 4 today, because it was within the last 200 years that it was given. The Pearl of Great Price. Notice all the stars there. That's going to become really relevant in a minute. The Pearl of Great Price is very important in why I left the church. Um, it's more work of Joseph Smith. He would get uh, documents and he would translate them and say, hey, this is the Book of Moses. This is the Book of Abraham. Uh, and he did uh, his own translation of the Bible, so that's part of the Pearl of Great Price. The Holy Bible, as translated correctly, they use the King James Version. They always put the caveat of as translated correctly uh, to differentiate it from, you know, not just believing everything that's in there. They regard the Holy Bible as inspired scripture, but knowing that there were errors in translation and things like that. Whereas the Book of Mormon, 
wasn't because it was like it was only one translation, like there was no generation loss. That's kind of how, that's why they put the Book of Mormon on a level above the Bible. The history of the church is a series of books published by the church. It has a lot of the early history of the church, things the prophets said, things like that. This is where a lot of problems come with the church. It's, it's these books called the History of the Church because it has a lot of the, the utterances of the early prophets and they said some crazy shit. And church publications and general conference. So church publications are magazines, articles. General conference is a, a conference that happens twice a year where the prophets and the apostles speak from Salt Lake City and it's broadcast around the world. And it's like a weekend of like three hour blocks of preaching about anything you can think of. Uh, yeah. So that's where the doctrine and teaching sources come. So there's a ton. And that can be a problem when you're trying to make sense of what the church actually teaches about A, B, or C. Because there's so many different sources, and one prophet will uh, contradict another prophet. Well, which prophet is right? Oh, so the newest prophet is right. That's sort of the, the thing. Well, how do you know that? So if he said this, and so he was wrong, but you know what I mean? Like, it's crazy. Anyways, that's Thomas S. Monson. He's the prophet today. If you're looking for a prophet, you know, he's dressed nicely. Uh, not this guy, uh, David Koresh. I, it wasn't appealing, crazy guys like that. That's why I like the, you know, they seemed respectable, I guess. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> I was going backwards. There we go, Mormon life. Okay. So this typical Mormon life for me. Uh, on Sundays, church was three hours long. Uh, it's not just all one three-hour sermon. It's three different blocks. So you have sacrament meeting for one hour. Then you have uh, Sunday school separated by age for an hour. And Sunday school separated by sex for an hour. So men would go to priesthood. Women go to relief society. So many meetings. Oh, my goodness. So many meetings. Um, because it's an all-volunteer church, uh, a lot of times you have more than one. They're called callings. Um, you know, the bishop will receive a revelation and say, Brother Carnegie, we're going to ask you to be the um, first counselor in the men's quorum, whatever. Uh, so when you get in there, then you end up having meetings. So, okay, well, when can we meet together? Oh, well, are you free Tuesday night? Okay, so Tuesday night we'll go. Oh, we have choir practice on Thursday. Okay. You end up having three or four, you get to church constantly three or four times a week, not just for the actual Sunday service. Uh, oh, I'm telling you. <laughs> if this is how they get a hold of you, yeah. and they keep you busy. Uh, institute, uh, something I did every week, which is sort of an in-depth script, scripture study for people between the ages of 18, 30, 18 to 30. Uh, so we each year we do a different book in <coughs> Book of Mormon or Holy Bible or New Testament, Old Testament, Doctrine and Covenants. That's, I think that's how they separated it. And it's it's very intensive, and I liked it because that's part of the scholarship thing. Or the scholarship thing was uh, continual learning. I would only date Mormons. That sucked because I lived in Brandon and there weren't not there weren't a lot of Mormons. Uh, when I moved to Winnipeg and I was like, whoa, there's a whole there's actually a ward in Winnipeg that's just for young single adults between 18 and 30 single. You, know, you all they all go to this one church or one, one building, which makes it very convenient to find someone to date. So uh, that's great. I, I was married within a year of moving to Winnipeg. <laughs> there there's actually people there. You know, it just increases your chances. <laughs> um, home teaching is something I did, which is uh, once a month, you're assigned uh, a partner or a companion, maybe a home teaching companion, maybe some of the same sex, and for men, they do home teaching, uh, which is basically, Brother Carnegie, you're going to go visit these three, three families each month and see how they're doing, give a spiritual lesson. So you go into the person's home. Usually it's someone who's less active, meaning they don't go to church anymore, basically. They're still on record, but they don't go to church anymore, that's less active. And, or inactive, whichever you want to call it. And so we give a spiritual lesson, usually something from a church publication, and we say, well, how are you doing? You know, how are things going? And, and if there's something going on in the home, like maybe uh, the husband lost his job and they're having financial difficulty, then we would go back to our priesthood leaders and say, Brother Joe is having, he lost his job and, you know, he needs some help. And so uh, maybe the bishop would contact him and say, you need some help. And there's a church welfare system, which is actually a great thing about the church. Uh, they have a very good welfare system. And uh, that was the point of home teaching, was to kind of keep in touch with everybody. So that was three nights a month, because there usually had three families, sometimes four, depending on how busy it was, how many people were in active. So between all this, and then having, near the end of my church life, I was at church for eight hours on Sunday, because I'd have meetings in the morning, then I'd drive 
get my wife and kids, bring them to church, so we'd have church, and I'd drive them home and come back, and then I'd have more things to do because I was in the, uh, I was the word clerk, so we'd have to do tithing after church. So we'd sit there and count all the money, and do all the paperwork, we'd drop it off at the bank. And then I'd have choir practice after that. It was long, hard days, and you know, honestly, church became not so enjoyable. It made it easier to leave. Kept it just, I wasn't really enjoying it at the time. So the nuts and bolts of why I left. So all that stuff is important to set up for why I left. It's totally related. Okay, so like I mentioned, modern-day revelation and scholarship. <laughs> Super important to me. Those are some of the things that are most important to me. I was a liberal Mormon. This is also important. Meaning I drank Pepsi. I didn't wear a white shirt and I had long hair. Back in the day. <laughs> that's, that's pretty much it for a liberal Mormon. The conservative Mormons won't drink caffeine. Not iced tea, nothing. Uh, it's just the way they're interpreting the word of wisdom. Um, and they, oh, they wore white shirts. If you didn't wear a white shirt, you, you got looks. It's like, oh, every, oh, on Sundays, not every day of your life, but on Sundays. <laughs> Whenever you're acting in a church thing. And sometimes if I was going to do a blessing for someone, because, uh, like I said, the spiritual gift, uh, you'd lay your hands on someone's head, you know, with oil and say, give a blessing of comfort or of healing. Whenever I did that, I'd put on a white shirt, because I felt that I just was supposed to. That's sort of one of those teachings you read about it in, in the church books. It's, like, oh, it's a better change. So I wear a white shirt for that. Plus, it make the people feel more comfortable. They think you're actually a real priesthood authority if you're wearing a white shirt. I tell you, it's messed up. Okay, I wore jeans to General Conference. What I, when I explain how General Conference is like this broadcast that comes from Salt Lake City, well, you'd go to the local church to watch it via satellite, and, you know, just project it up on the wall. And so I was like, I'm not going to wear a suit to watch TV. Like, there was no service at all. You just show up, you watch the thing, and you leave. And so most people wore suits. I did not. I wore jeans. I'm not dressing up if I don't have to. So that made me a liberal Mormon. Uh, I didn't believe the prophets and authorities were inerrant. And again, that made me a liberal Mormon. Though, I heard this nice comparison one time. While Catholics say the Pope is inerrant, they don't actually believe it, whereas Mormons say the prophet isn't inerrant, they don't actually believe it, if that makes sense. You can say, we know the prophets are just people, but if you actually question what they say, then you're in apostasy. And so, I didn't believe that. I did apologetics. Fair Farms, uh, these are apologetic uh, organizations. And SRM, which was a Usenet group, uh, soc.religion.mormon, I participated on this quite a bit, uh, talking about doctrine, mostly with apostates, awful apostates like myself. Um, and again, that made me a liberal Mormon because I was delving into the deeper doctrines and trying to figure out, well, where did this come from, and who said this, and, and why. And uh, that's part of my story. Why well, I left part two. This is where it all started. White shirt. This. <laughs> I don't know why this is such a problem for me. This honestly started, started my exit out of the church. Wow. And the person that was here, who prompted me to start thinking about the white shirt, heard that, they'd probably cry. <laughs> because they wouldn't want to know that. Uh, what happened was, remember I talked about doctrine and culture and how I like to research where things came from? I had a friend who was, let's say, what we call a TBM, which is a true believing Mormon. True believing Mormon. Means they believe every word of it. And she was saying to me one day, you know, our friend there, he didn't wear a suit to church this week. He's making a, he's providing a bad example for, uh, you know, everybody, the investigators. You know, the investigators are the people investigating the church that are coming, so you want to be a good example, right? So he's, he's providing a bad example. I said, well, it's just, so what? He's not wearing a suit, big deal. No, you're supposed to wear a suit and tie to church. I said, well, what do you mean you're supposed to? Well, it's doctrine that you're supposed to wear a white shirt and tie to church. I said, that's not doctrine, that's just our culture. No, it's doctrine. Okay, well... If you say it's doctrine, then where, how do you know it's doctrine? Where is the scriptural authority for your claim that it's doctrine to wear a white shirt? So I said, I'll investigate. I'll find out. I found this website. Oh, the internet. New Order Mormons. Uh, the highlighted portion of New Order Mormons are those who no longer believe some or much of the dogma or doctrines of the LDS church. So as I was doing the research into this white shirt thing, I was trying to find what prophet said, you know, you have to wear a white shirt. The official church sources didn't have any information, so I just went on Google. I said, I'm just going to look. I came across this website, and I thought, 
I guess I'm a New Order Mormon. You know, I drink Pepsi and blah, blah, blah. Basically, New Order Mormon means liberal Mormon. <laughs> because I don't toe the line on everything. Even though I believed in the church, I believed in the doctrines, I believed in the revelation and the authority, I just didn't believe every single word that came out of, the mouth was the word, out of their mouth was the word of God. I just didn't. Because if, if I did, I'd have to explain a lot of stuff. So anyways, I found this website. I thought, okay, well, I'm going to go here and ask my questions. They have a nice little convenient forum. A support forum right at the top. I said, I'm going to go in there. I'm going to look for my answers. And so a couple nights ago, actually, I went back to this site. I haven't been on it in years, and I found my very first post I ever made. It was on April 10th, 2005. It was my first post. And it was great because when I think about why did I leave the church, well, I just I basically wrote in this post why I left because these were the issues I was having. As I was investigating this white shirt thing, I started finding out, because I was going to non-church sources, I started finding out about all these hard doctrines and these things and these contradictions. I was really confused. I was like, that doesn't make sense. If this is true, how can this be true? And if he's really a prophet, then why did he do this? I'll get specific later on. Um, I was starting to get kind of disturbed. I couldn't talk about it at church. I couldn't talk about it with my church friends because it was taboo to question the very core revelations. It was taboo to question that stuff. And so I had no one that I could talk to about it. So I turned to the New Order, New Order Mormon, New Order Mormon Forum. Okay, so here's some of the things I was upset about with in, when I posted my first uh, post there. Upset with people mixing doctrine and culture. It's the white shirt thing. That's exactly what that is, mixing doctrine and culture. I was like, why don't people understand doctrine is pure and blah, blah, blah. And what happened was, as I was getting involved in the church locally, in the leadership levels, I saw no revelation. I saw people doing the best they had with what they could. They would say, Brother Jake, we want to offer you an invitation. God has called you to be <laughs> the priesthood quorum clerk. Yes, Bishop. <laughs> <laughs> but this time you can say, no, I'm busy. I'm busy. He's busy. And so I'm in this environment where I'm, I'm in these meetings, you know, I'm taking notes because I'm in charge of membership records and keep track of everything. And I'd hear Brother Jake refuse the calling. Yeah, but the calling is from God. Why would you refuse a calling? It's supposed to be, we would sit around and we would pray and wait for a revelation to say who we need to call to fill this position. And then Brother Jake would turn it down. That was crushing to me. Because I thought, well, why would God tell us to call Brother Jake if he was just going to refuse anyways? So this went on quite a bit, and so I saw I, I didn't see revelation. I just saw people doing the best they could with what they had. Um, the temple marriage thing, where you couldn't go to the temple to see your kids get married if you weren't a church member, it bothered me tremendously. And there was inconsistencies with how it was applied. In North America, it was different. In England, it was different. And this bothered me because it affected me personally. Um, I was going to get married in the temple, and I had to tell my parents that they couldn't come to my wedding. Like, that's a shitty thing to tell your parents. And uh, so you can wait in the lobby, and when we get married, we come out, and we're married. So I ended up not having a temple marriage because of other circumstances, which was nice because my parents, everyone was there for my wedding. And then uh, my wife and I got sealed a year later, which is basically the same as if you got married in a temple. It's not, that's the marriage that's forever for eternities, and then you have millions of babies in heaven. Um, <laughs> it does bashing a little bit, but have a beer. <laughs> Good times. So uh, this part really bothered me because of the lack of consistency I saw with it being applied in different areas of the world. Again, it led back to, you know, if the church is led by revelation, I guess I had a higher standard, maybe an unrealistic standard of how it should be run. As I was investigating the white shirt doctrine, I started going to outside church sources. I started reading these things about Joseph Smith and Brigham Young, who was the prophet after Joseph Smith was killed. That really disturbed me. And uh, Brigham Young was a prophet. Joseph Smith was killed, and he's a prophet that led them across the plains and settled Utah. And that's why there's so many Mormons in Utah, because they were having persecution. They said, we've got to get the hell out of the United States. Utah wasn't part of the United States at the time. Um, so they went across the mountains and settled there. That was Brigham Young. And... Um, I'll, I'll get to it later, but basically they, they did things that I thought a prophet of God should not be doing. Again, I had this standard that perhaps was unrealistic. Um, and so I said, where is the new revelation? 
Again, where is the revelation for a prophet led by, or for a church led by a prophet? Um, in, the, in the Mormon scriptures, uh, I mentioned earlier the Doctrine and Covenants, which were the collection of revelations given to Joseph Smith and some of the early prophets. And nothing had been added to it. No revelations had been added to it for over 100 years. About 100 years. And I thought, where is the revelation? Should we not still? There's things we need to deal with today. Issues in the world. Where's the revelation? I didn't see the new revelation. I didn't see any revelation. And at the end of that very first post I made on that day, back in 2005, this is what I wrote at the end of it. My goal, honestly, is to know and teach the true doctrine of Christ as taught by the scriptures and Latter-day prophets and apostles. And everyone I know personally that has left the church, this was their goal. They wanted to, they were investigating the doctrine. They wanted to know what the real doctrine was. They wanted to understand the best they could. They investigated. They found stuff out that they were never told about the church. Their, their base of all of their beliefs were shattered, and then they start over. Well, what if A is true, then how can B be true, basically? So that was my goal, and um, this left me feeling very alienated because I couldn't talk about this stuff at church because I only had an online forum. And it's not uncommon that when a spouse starts questioning the church or ends up not believing the church, that their marriage breaks up because of it. It is not uncommon. I know people that their wives have said, if you don't go to church, I'm leaving you. That is not a doctrine of the church. It's part of the culture of the church, not everywhere. And it seems to be dissipating uh, nowadays, uh, just from what I read and hear. Uh, but it was not uncommon for a long time that if you left the church, your marriage was done. So where could I go? You know, how could I tell my wife about these doubts? Eventually I did. And uh, eventually she actually stopped going to church about the same time I did. So that didn't become an issue in my, my relationship, but it was a fear that I had that that could have happened. And when I was leaving the church, when I was having these questions, I had two children and I married for about five, six years, I think. So maybe not that long, three years, something like that. Um, so I was pretty scared about that happening to me. So Joseph Smith's behavior, polygamy, I'm sure you've heard about Mormonism, polygamy. They don't practice it anymore nowadays, not the mainstream church, but it was a doctrine. It's still in their doctrine uh, today, still in their, script, their scriptures about practicing polygamy. Um, a lot of Mormons don't know that Joseph Smith practiced polygamy. They thought it started with Brigham Young in Utah. When I found out of Joseph Smith practicing polygamy, now polygamy itself I don't have a problem with. It's the way he used it to manipulate people. We'll pick on Brother Jake again. Brother Jake. Uh, you know, you're right there. Uh, is this your companion, by the way? No. Not partner? Oh, there, sorry. I just, I'm just guessing. Okay, right there. Okay, great. What's your name? Allison. Allison? Brother Jake. Okay, I'm Joseph Smith. I'm sending you on a mission for two years to England. See ya. Okay, once you're gone, hey, how you doing? You're going to be my wife. Well, he's gone anyway. That's right. The Lord commanded me to tell you that you're going to be my wife. Okay? That's... That's one of the many ways that he used to me that I found quite distasteful. He said, men's on, on the missions, marry the wives. <laughs> Women that were already married. Uh, wow, that's a really crappy uh -huh. thing to do. And, oh, there's tons of stuff like that. Um, anyways, that's something that really bothered me. Uh, Brigham Young, the second prophet of Mormonism, had a lot of racist things he said, particularly about blacks. And um, he kind of instituted the racist policies. As far as I could tell, some of the racist policies that carried on until 1978. And um, in a lot of that, you find this stuff in the history of the church, those books that the church actually publishes. You can go back and read the things that they said back then. So it was all official stuff, because I was worried about the sources. I wasn't just going to go to some anti mormon source and learn some twisted doctrine. I want to know what was actually happening. So I, went, I tried as best I could to go to official church sources. Uh, the Word of Wisdom, the thing that I was so proud of that set me apart, wasn't followed by the early church. It was adopted later on. And so as these things went through, I found more and more that the so-called prophets that had so-called revelation from so-called God were just acting within their own framework of their own culture and values at the time, like with the racism, uh, with other things that happened, with the word of wisdom. Uh, it actually happened during Prohibition. They finally said, no more drinking, Mormons. And so that's when they laid down the law and started actually following the word of wisdom. And I just found these things to be very convenient to happen at these times. And this is something that really bothered me. When I was, uh, I was in my mid-twenties, the prophet said, the current prophet, not some old prophet, the current prophet, 
when I was alive, said men are not to wear earrings and women are only to wear one set of earrings. Now, I don't wear earrings, so it didn't personally impact me. But to me, that was irrelevant. The problem that I had was that how does this have anything to do with being a Christian or being a follower of Christ or the church, being a good person? And to me, this just totally struck of, of looking at the outward appearance and not at the, the heart. And in the Bible, in the New Testament, it said God looks at the heart, not at the outward appearance. And so this was one of those, one of those contradictions that I said, what's going on here? Where's the revelation? And so a lot of these things I just had in the back of my mind for a long time. I knew about them, but I just sort of ignored them. I said, oh, that'll work itself out in heaven. That's sort of, you know, you can't, it'll just work itself out later. Uh, but that's something that really bothered me. And part of the problem was that in the Mormon scriptures, the Doctrine and Covenants 138, this is what the Lord had to say. When I, the Lord, have spoken, I have spoken, and I excuse not myself, whether by mine own voice or by the voice of my servants, it is the same. This is a very popular scripture in Mormonism. It's basically saying, whether I say it or my prophet says it, it's as if I was standing there saying it. So I said, well, if that's the case, then God is a racist and a misogynist and, uh, you know, all, all these things that the prophets have said throughout the years that were awful. This just led to more of the confusion in my brain about whether there really was revelation or not. Because like I said, the church is founded on revelation, and if it didn't have it, it was not worth my time. Uh, here are the two big nails in the coffin of why I left the church. And again, this is two reasons that are brought up by a lot of people I know, both online and in person, about why they left the church. It's not because they wanted to sin, they wanted to drink, and they wanted to do, 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 do. It's mostly doctrinal issues. The Book of Abraham, which was in the Pearl of Great Price, which is the Mormon scripture, that's the one that had all the stars beside it earlier, that I said, that's really important. The Book of Abraham, and I'll explain why. And the Book of Mormon DNA, in, in the Book of Mormon, and I'll explain these two. And the, the best, but the, the Book of Abraham, I'm just going to read you the Wikipedia, because this describes it perfectly, what it is. The Book of Abraham is an 1835 work produced by Joseph Smith that he said was based on Egyptian papyri, purchased from a traveling money, mummy exhibition. According to Smith, the book was a translation of some ancient records purporting to be the writings of Abraham while he was in Egypt, called the Book of Abraham, written by his own hand upon papyrus. Smith's translation of the papyri describes the story of Abraham's early life, including a vision of the cosmos. This is Abraham, the same Abraham from the Old Testament. So he's saying that this papyri that showed up in this traveling show was it just happened to be written by Abraham, the prophet of the Old Testament, um, by his own hand. And it told the story of Abraham being uh, sacrificed by like uh, pagan priests and stuff like that. It's a little hard to see. There's a guy laying down here. And up at the top, these were the portions that were missing. And there's actually drawn in portions where Joseph drew in what's supposed to be there. Remember, he's a prophet, OK? It's in hieroglyphics. A little bit about the book of Abraham. So it's written in 1835. Egyptian, hieroglyph Egyptian hieroglyphics were not understood at the time. It was quite, the, the Rosetta Stone, I don't know if it was found yet, but in certainly North America, hieroglyphics were not understood. Uh, the original papyri were lost in a fire in 1871, but fragments were found in a museum in 1966. And as I was researching this, and I found this out, I'm getting tingles right now, I'm just thinking about it, I was like, holy, we know, how we can read the hieroglyphics now. If you can take the original and, and have it translated by people that know, and if it was the same, holy crap, he would be a real prophet. He would be true. Evidence. Because the, the Book of Mormon, the golden place, the angel of Mormon, I took him back to heaven. We don't have them. But here we have, I know, convenience. But here we have the source material. And now, like I said, now Egyptian hieroglyphics were understood how amazing it would be. So. The papyri, this is a, a facsimile from the Book of Mormon that Joseph Smith, there's numbers here. One, two, three, four, he, he numbered and said, number number one is this, and number two is this. He describes what each of them are. Okay, Book of Mormon, look in that corner, see how they're different? See the guy's head? Up in the corner there, that's what this thing actually is. It's the Egyptian Book of Breathings, the Book of Dead. It's a funeral, it's a funeral text that Egyptians use, it's, uh, it's common. Now we know it's common. And um, where Joseph Smith filled in this missing information, like the guy's head who's like with the knife, 
and the, the, down here is the bird, up there is a human head. It's hard to see when, in the surrounding room, but it's a human head. They're not the same. If you go to Wikipedia, you're not going to be able to read this necessarily, but I'll just summarize it. On, on the Wikipedia for this, it totally lays it out. In number one, Joseph, Joseph Smith's tra- explanation, and on this side, what the Egyptologists say, Mormon and non-Mormon. Number one, Joseph says, figure one is an angel of the Lord. Number two, or sorry, number one, but it's actually you know, the soul of some Egyptian person. Like, you go down the list, he's wrong on every count. Every count, he is wrong. It, apologetics try to get around this, saying, oh, it wasn't the real papyri, uh, it must have been a different portion. But, no. I've read it. It's, it's, he lays it out very nicely, because Joseph, if anything, if anything was um, detailed, because he had all these manuscripts come across him all the time, and he would he would number them, he would say, oh, this Egyptian hieroglyphic is very convenient. He took this Egyptian hieroglyphic from the papers he found, and he wrote out a paragraph saying what it meant. The next one, wrote out a paragraph saying what it meant. And we have these original papers, and again, they're wrong on every count. He's just making shit up. <laughs> so when this happened, I said, "What? Who do I believe? Do I believe Joseph Smith and Revelation and the Church and this thing I've built my spiritual life on all these years, or do I believe the actual evidence?" It's not an easy question to answer when you have your entire social world, spiritual world, home world revolving around this church and this doctrine that is so core to you that you alienated your family because of, alienated your friends because of, because of, oh, buddies, I can't go up with you anymore, I don't drink anymore, I don't know, being part of that lifestyle anymore, so I can't be friends with you. I didn't quite say that, but you just stop being friends with the people you don't see anymore. I have my church friends, which they're fine people, but I, I, I alienated these people, and for what? So this is going on in my brain. So this, the cognitive dissonance, dissonance is, is killing me because I don't know what to believe. I believe A, but B is showing me that A is wrong, but yeah, I still believe A. I believe B. You know what I mean? It's just your brain gets messed up. It's really hard to describe what you go through, what you go through during this time. It's very difficult. But I thought, if he made it up, then maybe the Book of Mormon is made up. Because <laughs> it's pretty much the same way he translated the Book of Mormon. He got these plates and he translated by the gift of God, supposedly. And so that's how he said he translated the book of, of Abraham, but through the gift of God. Well, damn, that's really hard to ignore, even for a believer. Uh, so if the Book of Mormon made, was made up, maybe everything was made up. How God called him, and he had these experiences. And like Joseph, oh, he was full of stories. Not only God, but Peter, James, and John personally visited him uh, as resurrected beings, the people from the New Testament. He was visited by Elijah and Elisha and Moses. Personal visitations from all of these beautiful <coughs> people is what he claimed. So I thought, he's just making all this, everything up. And if everything's made up, then there is no modern day revelation, there is no authority, there is no church. That's the conclusion I came to. It took me a little bit to get there though. The, the other, how am I doing for time, Jeff? Am I right? I told you I'm not paying attention. Okay, we're almost done. Yeah, one more page. Okay. <sighs> okay, so this is going on at the same time I found about the Book of Mormon. The book, this is from the actual, uh, inside the Book of Mormon, you open it, official, this is what it says. The book was written by many ancient prophets, by the spirit and prophecy of, and revelation. The record gives an account of the two great civilizations. One came from Jerusalem. After thousands of years, all were destroyed except the Lamanites, and they are the principal ancestors of uh, American Indians. So today's Aboriginal people, um, some of those Mormons will call them Lamanites, because everyone's killed off, in, in the Book of Mormon, everyone's killed off except the Lamanites, who are the principal ancestors of American Indians. That's, that's the claim of, in the Book of Mormon, and that, that the church has believed for years and years and years. I was like, that's a testable claim. Sweet. It's DNA. Okay, so in the late 1990s, genetic testing, genetic testing was starting to be done on Aboriginal uh, uh, nations all across North America and some into South America. And as you kind of know, their ancestors are from Siberia, not Jerusalem. There's no trace of Hebrew DNA in Aboriginals. And even if, even if, 
this tribe came over from Jerusalem. The Book of Mormon is, it tells the story of this group and this family comes from Jerusalem, sails across to North America, then populates North America, basically. Uh, they're, they're Hebrew. Um, so there's no trace of Hebrew DNA, none at all. So I'm finding this out pretty much at the same time I'm reading about the, the uh, Book of Abraham. It's all happening at the same time for me. Because I'm, I'm reading these sites, and I'm like, oh my crap. So I read the apologetics, so I always read the apologetics because I wanted to try to really understand and not be fooled. I don't want to be tricked by some anti Mormons. So I read the apologetics, but they just didn't hold up. I stopped believing the church was true. I was learning about skepticism and the baloney detection kit all at the same time because as I felt I was being fooled, I said, I don't want to be fooled anymore. So I started learning about skepticism. You might have heard of a podcast called the. Uh, 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 can you think of the name of the, the, the Nobel Brothers? Yeah, I'm trying to blank Skeptics Guide to the Universe. Oh my goodness, I can't believe I blanked out on that. Skeptics Guide to the Universe. Started listening to that. So I'm learning about these skepticism things and I'm applying them to my knowledge about the church. And I'm seeing all these logical fallacies after one after another and how evidence actually works. I learned about the brain and sleep paralysis. I said, those weren't demons entering my body. I was experiencing sleep paralysis. Why didn't someone tell me that seven years ago when I talked to them? And I said, these things are happening. I was led to believe demons were trying to enter my body. And I, was, I was having sleep paralysis. It's a brain thing. It's not unknown. So all these things opened my eyes to reality hugely. Uh, it was really hard to realize that everything you believed is wrong. That's a very hard thing to come to realize. So within that first post I made on the New Order Mormon Board in 2005, I stopped going to church within four months. Because as I was having these questions, I just couldn't talk about it at church. I tried. I really did. And eventually I thought, you know, maybe I can just go to church as a non-believer and just be quiet about it. And just keep there for the culture and, you know, the fellowshipping. But I couldn't do it. I tried. I would go to the Sunday school classes, and I'd sit there and hold my tongue, and I'm not the kind of person that holds their tongue. And I sat there, and I was like, oh, this is killing me, killing me to hear them talk about historical facts that I knew were wrong. But Joseph Smith had 30 wives. Don't you know that, people? Oh, I, I just sat there. Anyways, so I stopped going to church, and when those logical tools I used that I was learning about um, the researching logic and things like that. I applied it to the prophets, I applied it to the church, and then Jesus and God. It all fell away with, pretty quickly once I stopped doing the church and the prophets and Revelation. Just all, it all went. Because none of it held up to the standard, this new standard of evidence that I had. None of it held up, so I just let it all go. So, to sum up, where I am now, I've embraced science. Uh, because science saved me, I was saved by science. Because <laughs> science saves, that's going to be my new Facebook thing. Science saves. Well, that could be a t shirt. Science saves. Eh? Hey? Yes. Ham presents. Okay. Um, because, because I wanted to live an evidence based life. And I thought it was before. I thought the evidence for the church was good. Because I had revelation from God that it was true. But my standard of evidence has changed once I understood what evidence really is. Um, I've embraced secular values, humanist values, you might say. Uh, because when, once I left the church and I, all this was gone, I said, well, what am I going to believe now? What's, what are my values going to be? Am I going to, you know, it could be anything. It could be anything. So it's kind of like a fresh start. But I, always, I already had things inside me. Like I had all those years of church that helped me become a better person. Um, it helped me to... Uh, you know, want to be a better person and work towards it. Um, the church left me with a lot of good things, a lot of good values, and I can see people as, as spiritual brothers and sisters, I guess you could say now. Actually, I just thought of this thing, because when I was a member, or when I was a believer, I saw everyone as a spiritual brother and sister to me. And I kind of felt a kinship with them, even if they're a stranger. But it's true, we all are brothers and sisters, like genetically, right? You go back far enough, we all are related. So that's kind of neat, actually. So, uh, but... That, that's what happened, because I, I thought, well, what am I going to do now? I embraced, I embraced the need for education in my kids and in me. Um, I, was, I have four children. I, I'm very, very aware of wanting to give them proper 
sort of basis, a scientific basis for their world, for their life. So then they can go on and do whatever they want. If they want to be religious, I don't care, that's fine. I just hope that they have a basis of reality that they can go forth from. Uh, and it's working. It totally is working. They like science. I'm like, my little science geeks, it's awesome. <laughs> um, <laughs> It is awesome. Actually, my seven-year-old Avery, uh, Jeff, that, that app you showed us, that, that time tree app, we've been playing with that thing. It's awesome. I say, okay, okay, kids, okay, let's think about, um, oh, anyways, this app, you put in two things and it shows you how far uh, how far back the common ancestors lived between the two of them. I said, okay, what, what animal would we most be, be closely related to? And we, okay, well, let's guess this. And we'd have a little contest to see who could guess which would be the most closely related. And also the farthest, my, nine, my nine-year-old son said bacteria. So I put it in, I was like, you win. It's like 2.3 billion years ago, our common ancestor with bacteria. I didn't tell him that. He just figured it out. Anyways, I love that stuff. That's awesome. Um, I feel like I have a lot of proselytizing to make up for because I was very... Uh, <laughs> I was preaching to my family and my friends because I believed it and I wanted to share it. The same way I feel about now with... I'm part of the Winnipeg Skeptics. The same way I feel now about what I believe, I want to share it. Uh, I want to be a missionary for it, I guess. I did that with the church. I have I got 11 years to make up for it, so I got a long way to go. Thankfully, I never converted anybody. I did baptize one person though. So, but she's out of the church now too. She's a lesbian. <laughs> 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 I was like yes. <laughs> so I was absolved of that sin, <laughs> and that pretty much sums up the story of why I joined and why I left. Questions. <laughs> Track for questions? Are we okay to? No, come up and. Okay. Oh, he's going to facilitate, so I'll just. <laughs> should I stand here? Sorry. Okay, yes, ma'am. Can you tell us a little bit about the impact your leaving the church had on your family, your sure. wife, your cousins who were members as well? Sure. Uh, because I was a convert, uh, first in my immediate family, they never really criticized me for it. Um, they were kind of like, okay, this is what Scott's doing. So for them, and when I left, they didn't really say much either. They were kind of like, okay. Uh, but for my family and my auntie and uncle, they're awesome people. They never called me and said, Scott, what are you doing? What's wrong with you? The devil's of you, or the devil's got a hold of you, whatever. For my cousins, uh, my cousin I was closest to has also left the church. He lives in Utah. Um, and the ones that are still in it, they've never, I've never had anyone, even people I knew from church, call me up and say, Scott, you know, you're wrong, you're evil. You in fact, I, I was hoping they'd make more effort to keep me in the church. You think they would, right? <laughs> you think so, but actually, you know, most people are, are have manners and are polite. And, and uh, I, like I said, I, when I stopped by the church, I remember thinking, why aren't people trying harder to, I'm not getting phone calls. Don't they notice I'm not there? Because usually, like, well, Scott's not here, we got to call him up. What's wrong, Brother Carney? So, uh, impact, oh, and for my family, uh, it was really hard between me and my wife because um, I was sharing my, my issues with her and she was seeing them too and she was having the same issues. So it was more, because she wasn't as much of a zealot as I was, so I was more a zealousy <laughs> with, with regards to the church. Uh, so it didn't change her world as much as it did change mine. Um, and the biggest question I had was would she, you know, would we break up because of it? And uh, we didn't, we're, we're separated now, but because of other issues, uh, but, which burns me because my former church friends will say, oh, well, Scott left the church, that's why they're broken up. Mm. In fact, this guy, one leader came to talk to me, oh, uh, the state president, who's like the big honcho, came to talk to me, said, Scott, you know, people lose their children, and their wives over this stuff, blah, blah. Uh, so I'm like, he's somewhere thinking, yeah, I told him so, but whatever. Does that answer that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Next question. Yes, sir, Scott Burton. Yeah, um, a lot of the journey that you described, you sort of focused a lot on the intellectual side, you know, sort of your reasonings, and your research and mm -hmm. stuff like that. I'm curious if there's also uh, a different sort of <coughs> psychological or emotional process that you went through. Like, like, first of all, when you first joined up, I'm just wondering, like, if there was sort of a need that you're looking for. You mentioned some things like, you liked how it felt like you belonged. So I don't yeah. know if there was a need for belonging or about standing out, like almost like a rebellion or, or just yeah. an identity forming. And whether through the process of being in the church that perhaps there was a change or maturity or something that you were able to be a little bit more secure and that you could look outside and you didn't have to have a strong a need for belonging or something. I'm just I curious if there was a bit of a journey through. Well, definitely in the beginning it was because of the support, because I, I, I had my heart broken by this woman and I was really having a hard time and I just wanted, I needed some relief, some spiritual relief. 
and I definitely found that there, so that was a big part of it. And then, as I went through the years, I, I had things that always bothered me in the back of my head, like work, the white shirt thing, and stuff like that. Um, so that was part of it, was a little bit of a fr frustration with other church members that I thought, I thought were too dogmatic. That, that was part of it. And something I mentioned, that how at the end, I had so many callings, I was at church for eight hours every Sunday, I was, I was unhappy, I wasn't happy anymore. That didn't make it easier to question it and to say, is this right? If I was still happy and content, it might never have come to that, perhaps. Uh, maybe I would have came across that information and just kind of rushed it off, um, perhaps. But do you think you're maybe a stronger, or more confident person today that allowed you to question more than, say, you would have in the earlier days? Well, you know, you're growing mature over years, I guess. I always thought that I was sure of myself, pretty much. When I joined the church, I was so sure, you know, like anything else. Uh, so, I don't know, that's kind of always my nature, like the questioning nature. I always kind of have that, that anti-authoritarian nature in me. So by joining the church, I was like rejecting the world. It's like, hey, I don't drink, look at me, yeah, I'm a Mormon, blah, blah, blah. You know, uh, <laughs> that was part of it. Now, hey, I'm an atheist, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> I'm, another, I'm another minority. It's great. I keep putting myself in these problems here. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but but uh, but I was I was legitimately following just my heart the whole time. My heart and my brain working in conjunction. It was it was legitimate. Thank you. No problem. Yes, you want to know about the magic underwear? Okay, look that up on Wikipedia. No, nobody. You pointed at me. That's exactly. No, no, back there. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, I want to know about magic. Underwear. I know. People always ask about the magic underwear. Oh. That's good. Um, it, it's a more personal question, but I'm yeah. curious about. Um, you said you had to leave some people sort of behind, you know, the, the friends, and, and yeah. it was difficult with your mom and dad and so on. And mm -hmm. How has it been for you to try and sort of connect with those people again? Like, sure. how is that going? Great. Uh, my best friend at the time, we lived together at the time, and that's, and that's when I said, look, I have to move out because I'm trying to quit drinking and doing this church. Uh, I can't live in, I was living in a house with three other guys. It was like this huge party house, and I just couldn't live there anymore, so I moved on my own apartment and we lost touch and now uh, in the last few years we've been just getting together again which is nice and actually we went for supper last month and he said listen Scott when you join that church because we were talking about it he said I was just thinking Scott's doing this thing I'm just going to support him as best I can because he wasn't going to change my mind no one's going to change my mind you know that has to come from within uh, I had people a few people try to change my mind when I joined the church and say hey Scott's not the devil but they were like fundamentalist Christians St. Joseph Smith no. was like of the devil it wasn't from sort of Something that would have worked better would have been like a more evidence sort of base probably would have been more effective with me. Um, so, uh, but it, it's been nice and it's been nice to be around my family without them worrying about me preaching. I used to leave the Book of Mormon, you know, behind at my mom's house. Hey, mom, da, 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 you know, stuff like that. I did that all the time. But your parents, you said you grew up Catholic. I grew up Catholic, yeah. So they're still Catholic. My my mom is Catholic, but my dad actually is an atheist, and I didn't know that until recently. <laughs> 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 yeah, uh, he's not military like I am. Um, <laughs> but but I did. So it, it's better now because there isn't that thing. Oh, Scott's here. He's going to be preachy. He's going to want us. I always invited my brother to church. He used to live with me and said, hey, you're going to come to church with me this week, blah, blah, blah. It never happened. So uh, at least that is off the table, which is nice. Yes? Yeah. When you first left the church, what did you do to prevent yourself from going crazy with all the time? <laughs> like all the like the void in your life in yeah. terms of time commitment. That, yeah. As I've heard that from a lot of people, especially yeah. what do you like, do now? not just well, not from Mormons, but like evangelicals or whatever, yeah. where it's close to the church, and close to the community, yeah. and then when you leave, there's this huge, I mean, eight hours a day on Sunday, like yeah. four slept in. Before you do the yeah. <laughs> slept in on Sunday, that's nice. Psychologically, that must yeah. have been. <laughs> 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 no, well, no, I did start thinking I need to find a new community but I didn't know what to do necessarily. And I didn't really mention it here, but actually I became a magician around the same time, and that was actually very important because I was learning about how the mind works, how it is easy it is to trick people and to trick yourself. And I was learning that at the same time some of this stuff was going on, and, and I'm surprised I actually didn't mention that in there because it was quite influential in my decision uh, or my realization that the church wasn't what it said it was. So I started becoming a magician and going to like a magic club. Uh, I joined a band, and so I tried to just keep myself busy that way. But I'm a father of several children, so I was busy that way. So I got to be with them more, which was nice. Uh, 
uh, it's actually very freeing that time because it, it does eat up your time quite a bit. A lot of if you're called to be the bishop, it's a five I think it's a five year calling, and if you have young children, forget it. Like you're hardly ever gonna see them. You're at church all day. You have several things during the week. You're responsible for the whole ward of like you know 100 to 150 people. So you're you have no social life. You have no hobbies. So. Yes, sir. Do you get the sense of a lot of other people sort of looking at the available evidence now and reevaluating the beliefs? It's, it's hard to tell because the church doesn't publish their data about how many people they have, how many leave each year. Or just with people you talk oh, to. Oh, with people I'm talking? Well, I mean, the majority of people, the majority of people I'm talking to now are. No, actually, wait. Yes, because I'm surprised with how many 